Okay, hey guys, uh, this is Mrs. Campbell, obviously. Um, this is the first lecture that I'm going to be doing, and probably we'll do maybe one of these a week or one every couple weeks, depending on where we are in a unit. But whenever there's something that needs maybe a little bit more instruction or information, hopefully this is an easy way to get stuff across to you guys without you having to flip through a slideshow on your own or read a bunch of docs or anything like that. Plus this way you get a little bit of a sense of me and my personality and what it might be like if you were actually in the classroom. Uh, in terms of what I would be pointing out as things that are important. So today we're going to talk about geography, not the most interesting of topics, but very important in terms of the development of a successful civilization, especially one like ancient Mesopotamia, uh, which is really the first major civilization uh, within the world. So very important in terms of the first development of a lot of things. So last week you guys looked at the agricultural revolution. Hopefully you were able to pick out some of the causes and consequences. Uh, one of the big consequences was urbanization and along with urbanization comes a lot of positives, yes, but unfortunately a lot of negatives as well, things like slavery. Um, uh, definitely the development of permanence is very significant and we're going to be looking at that throughout the unit on Mesopotamia. Today, like I said, we're going to focus on geography and how geography helps shape the way that Mesopotamian civilization develops. If you look over here, this is the Fertile Crescent. You might have talked about this in other classes. Mesopotamia is right in the middle of the Fertile Crescent. And this is a huge region of very moist, fertile land, home to many of the first civilizations, Mesopotamia and Egypt being um, those first two, and certainly the, fir the two big ones we will look at at the beginning of our course. But that fertile land really allows for the development of very successful civilizations. One of the first cities that develops actually is along the west bank here of the Mediterranean, early city called Jericho. It's not technically part of Mesopotamia, but uh, interesting to look at some of the first cities that develop before Mesopotamian civilization really rises. So this is the first true city approximately 10,000 years ago, whereas Mesopotamia we're looking at, you know, uh, 6,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. So the key here was the development of agricultural surplus. That was really big because once they had a surplus that they were then able to create permanence, domesticate animals, and really start building cities. Jericho had approximately 2,000 people, lots of job specialization, so that meant that people were able to focus not just on like hunting and, hunting and gathering and all of those kinds of things. Because there was the food surplus, people could become artists and um, start making architecture and all of those kinds of things. So that was very important. Also, there is um, evidence of the formation of a religion and also some kind of a military-esque elite within Jericho. So if you look at these pictures of early Jericho, you can see that, and again, this is very old first city, so obviously there's not a lot left in terms of archaeological remains, but you can see that around this large city, it looks like there's a very delineated almost wall, and that's a really significant thing for sure. The development of a wall, you know, if you think about what that might signify, obviously is signifying things like the need for protection, whether it's protection from animals, protection from invaders, uh, but definitely it establishes the fact that they want to protect their city, their citizens, uh, and that obviously means there's some importance there to them, which is very important to us. Um, their houses are round mud brick houses, again, because they're building in mud brick. We don't have a lot of archaeological remains. Um, the expanding wealth obviously show is able to then showcase the building of walls as well. That means they have to have a sizable labor force in order to drag the stones from the, the riverbed. But at this point, you've still got very limited construction tools. Um, when you guys were looking at the hominids, you probably saw the... Um, growth in terms of the creation of early tools, you know, with Lucy, you know, maybe using branches, and then with Homo habilis being the handyman and the first one to really create stone tools. But then Neanderthal and Homo sapiens really developing um, much more skilled tool construction, which is important. So at this time, we've got skilled tool construction, but still very primitive tools. As I said before, the other big thing about Jericho is that 
they think from archaeological remains that they were governed by a very powerful uh, group, a very powerful ruling uh, religious elite, elite, possibly. The other big civilization, or sorry, the other big city at this time is Ketel Hayuk, approximately four to 6,000 people, so larger than Jericho. This was considered the most advanced Neolithic city. Um, some of the differences here are that they have rectangular, very uniform buildings. So it shows maybe evidence of a little bit more in terms of city planning here because they are rectangular and they all sort of fit together. De definitive proof of religious shrines show a powerful ruling elite. Also very highly involved trade specialization at the time and a lot of pottery sculpture and jewelry making within Ketel Hayuk. And these are some of the um, findings from Ketel Hayuk. Again, because it is so ancient, there isn't a lot of archeological remains, but what is um, what does remain definitely tells us something about the civilization in terms of you know when we look over here power and fertility and those sorts of things when we look over here the idea you know of hunting or dancing or something like that very definitely important in terms of showing us the sorts of things that were going on within the civilization for us, as we move from those early cities into Mesopotamia, where you've got many very advanced urban um, cities, our essential unit question is going to be, why is Mesopotamia considered the birthplace of civilization? Because that is what it's called and what it's referred to. So even though a lot of people think like, ah, Mesopotamia is boring, we don't want to talk about it. It is very important in terms of the way that other civilizations after it are developed and the the things that Mesopotamia creates that other civilizations then build on. So when you look at that fertile crescent again, Mesopotamia, between these two rivers here, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and actually the name Mesopotamia in Greek means the land between the two rivers, and in Old Persian, fertile crescent, and in Aramaic, house of the two rivers. So obviously fertility is very important, rivers are very important, and it's a key area to be able to set up um, a civilization that is going to be very highly developed and very advanced. As we're looking at geography, the importance of geography, we will look at at the beginning of each unit, at least for a little bit. We'll spend a little bit more time in geography here than we will in other civilizations. But the big thing to think about with geography is what are the advantages and disadvantages? Geography certainly helps for development of life. It helps a lot in terms of protection or isolation, whether there's mountains or deserts or seas or oceans, that's going to mean something to a civilization in terms of if they are protected or isolated. Also, obviously, sustaining life is very important. Do you have the resources around you to be able to keep yourself alive and keep your civilization flourishing? Also, geography is going to give us an understanding of the peoples, the civilization, what do they believe in, what's important to them. We'll see that a lot, especially with ancient Egypt, when we talk about the Nile and the importance of geography for them, but definitely very important in all the civilizations. So what I'm going to want you guys to do um, after this is, if you're following along with the note, which you should be, I should have said that at the beginning, but hopefully you read my instructions, um, what I would like you to do is pause the video or pause uh, this lecture, watch the video that's on the next slide. I've also linked it in your note. And then once you've watched the video, I want you to come back to the slideshow. And on the next slide is a map. And I want you to think about what are the advantages and disadvantages that geography provides for Mesopotamians. So look at, and this is the video, but look at the north south, east, and west in terms of what advantages are up here, over here, down here, over here for the people of Mesopotamia. Okay, so pause the video now, watch this, and then come back and we will talk about the map. Okay? Great. Okay, I'm assuming you're back now. Feels a little awkward because I just paused for like five seconds, but uh, I'm assuming you watched the video. Kind of a cute little video that showcases definitely things we'll talk about with Egypt. Um, 
but hopefully gave you some ideas in terms of looking at this map of Mesopotamia and some of the things you found. Now in class, obviously, we would chat about these things together. We would take up what's going on in the north, south, east, west. But for you guys, I'm just going to kind of run through those things. So hopefully you've taken some notes and we can go through together and you can see what kind of things um, are similar to what you came up with. Um, and maybe if anything... Uh, you think like, oh, I thought this, but maybe not, or, oh, she didn't mention this, but I think this is also another good um, point. All of that is good stuff to keep in mind. So in terms of the north, probably what you notice is that the north, you've got mountains. Mountains, very, very important. They signify a few things in civilizations. Depending on their height, they are very good for defense. In the case of Mesopotamia, the Zagros Mountains not super high, not high enough to completely isolate you from invasion. Though again, there's always ways around mountains, say by elephants, and we'll talk about that. But um, certainly mountains are good for defense. Whether they're high or not, it makes things difficult for invaders to come in. The other thing is in the north, they're much closer to the Mediterranean. So that's good in terms of connecting to other areas in terms of connecting to any of the surrounding regions <coughs> for trade and the flourishment of Mesopotamian civilization. You've also got very reliable rainfall in the north, um, and the rivers rarely flood. It's mostly rocky up there, but the forests at the foothills are full of animal life. So mountains are always going to be a few things. It's always going to be defense, protection, um, resources, as well as um, the possibility of animals and the resources that those that animal life would provide. In the east, sort of some of the things, the same things we've already talked about, got the Zagros Mountains. So forests at the foothills, again, are going to be wildlife and any of those kinds of resources. The mountains are going to give you some protection from invaders. The one thing that we didn't really mention with the north um, but certainly is applicable there as well, is that mountains also add for or allow for a lot of hiding places for rebels. So if you've got nomadic tribal groups who are wandering around and trying to look for a place to invade, they can very easily hide in mountains and in the foothills of mountains. So good in terms of large-scale invasion, but in terms of small-scale invasion like nomadic groups, mountains do provide some kind of shelter for them. In the south, what you probably noticed, few natural resources in terms of forests, but a lot of building materials still around the south. Marshes are very important because you've got the Persian Gulf down there. You've also got where the Tigris and the Euphrates come together. So it's a very fertile area. You've got a lot of fish. You've got a lot of waterfowl. So those are great resources. Because of the extreme fertility, you actually have a lot of civilizations developing towards the south of Mesopotamia. Marshes also give you some protection if you're trying to invade on a boat. It's a little bit difficult to get through marshes, you know, if you've got a big, huge warship. So that offers you some protection. Invaders, of course, can come from the Persian Gulf, though. It's just not as easy as coming from somewhere like the Mediterranean or, you know, the Pacific Ocean or something like that. Um, definitely a little bit more difficult in terms of getting through the Persian Gulf. So really good in terms of fertility, really good in terms of resources. You do have some protection, but you also have some access for invasion. In the West, desert, only desert. Syrian desert. Um, deserts, of course, provide a lot of isolation. People can try to get through them, and certainly people do, and sometimes they're successful, but they're very, very dangerous. So the possibility of invaders is very small. You might have nomadic invaders that are coming from the desert, but they're extremely dangerous, which also means that for you as Mesopotamians, it would be very hard to get out from the West or to expand into the West. And for us, if you go back to that original map, the West is between Mesopotamia and Egypt, which means that you do have connection between these two for trade, usually through the Mediterranean. But in terms of invasion, there's a lot of protection. It makes it really difficult for uh, any invasions to happen unless it is smaller nomadic tribes. You do sometimes have oasis in the desert, and certainly when we talk about Egypt, we'll talk about some significant oasis points, but again, very dangerous. In terms of the climate, 
Uh, the climate of Mesopotamia is not immediately ideal. The summers are hot and dry, so droughts can kill crops. There can be famines. In the spring, you've got a lot of melt, so water runs down from the mountains and causes flooding in the um, rivers, but the people actually find a way to control that flooding through irrigation, which is really important. And